In just 40 minutes of carnage, the city lost its innocence. The fantasy game that killed real people. Julian Knight was born on March 4, 1968. He was only 10 days old when a family with an army background adopted him. He often moved to different cities and countries during his childhood, including Melbourne, Pukkanpunyal, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. In 1975, Knight's family settled in Laverton, Victoria, where he attended Laverton Primary School for three years. At age 12, his parents got divorced. This was the beginning of distress in his life as he loved both his parents and never wanted them to separate. He was a class clown, making jokes and entertaining everybody. He was hilarious, thoughtful, and intelligent, and always had good marks. He attended Westbourne Grammar School, Fitzroy High School, and Melbourne High School. From the beginning, he was fascinated with guns and the military. An entry written by students in the 1985 Melbourne High School yearbook says, Julian Swapo Knight inherited the role of cadet unit loony and chief political agitator. While at Westbourne, he showed deep interest in weapons and vital interests in Nazi Germany and World War II. In 1986, he attended La Trobe University to study French, German history, and politics. He was good in studies with an average IQ of 132. At age 14, he joined the Australian Army Cadets and served in two cadet units, the Norwood High School Cadet Unit and the Melbourne High School Cadet Unit. At age 17, when he was still in high school, he enlisted in the Army Reserve and served as a trooper in the 4th, 19th Prince of Wales Light Horse Regiment. On 13th January 1987, at age 18, Knight entered the Royal Military College, Dunturum. He dreamed of having a military career, but his principal interest was in weapons. He had no interest in studies and performed poorly at studies but gained good results and expertise in utilizing weapons. Knight had been training as an army officer at the Royal Military College since the 13th of January. He was heavily bullied and victimized in college. He would never show any temperament, but his face would show pain and annoyance. He was often ridiculed and ashamed in front of other kids. It was getting harder for him to be patient anymore. Knight was beginning to show a hyperactive attitude and sometimes would overreact to situations. On May 31, 1987, he got drunk and stabbed his company sergeant major in a Canberra nightclub. He then quickly surrendered to two Australian federal police officers. He was charged with malicious wounding, assault, and bodily harm. He was out on bail after paying a $5,000 self-surety and was due to appear in the Australian Capital Territory. He was discharged from the Army on July 24, 1987. He tried to re-enlist into two Army Reserve units, the 7th Transport Squadron and the unit he served earlier in 1985 through 1987, but was rejected due to the criminal charges. He had a huge ego and was now involved in a few minor assaults and discipline issues. He always believed he was the only competent person sitting in the crowds. His drinking habits were getting worse. On August 9, 1987, Sunday, 11.30 a.m., Julian Knight woke up in his mother's house. It was the 16th day since his discharge from the Australian Army. He was employed as a storeman and a driver for a Melbourne clothing firm, Coogie Rarity Stores Limited. Still, he found it near impossible to meet the weekly repayments on his $6,000 Defence Force Credit Union car loan. He was already two weeks behind with the repayments, and he still owed over $5,800. In addition to the car loan, he had around $1,200 of other debts. He purchased a car in 1987, a Tirana SLR 5000. He finally decided to sell it to get rid of the debt, but he couldn't find any buyer that would give him the right amount. His financial issues began to provide him with anxiety. His problems didn't seem to stop as no one was willing to stand with him, including his girlfriend or friends. He would consume alcohol until he would doze off. A letter from a social worker was sent to Knight's biological mother. But she never responded to the letter because she didn't want to carry his burden. He knew that he was adopted and wanted to meet his mother once. Her refusal to communicate with her son enraged him. On August 9th, Knight attended a belated birthday party for his mother at his grandmother's house in the Melbourne suburb of Hawthorne. He consumed two cans of beer and left the party in his car. After driving his sister home, he drove around the Clifton Hill area. 
He went to see his ex-girlfriend and stayed there for only five minutes. Once again, he was aimlessly driving on the roads. His car broke down on the way home. He hardly brought the car home, changed his clothes, and once again consumed alcohol. In a fury, he went to the Royal Hotel, a local pub, at 5.30 p.m. None of his friends were in the hotel, so he drank alone for three hours. At 8.50 p.m., he began to feel dizzy and had a vision of soldiers being ambushed. He felt as if it was a call to arms. At 8.55 p.m., he rushed from the hotel and ran back to his mother's house. He reached home in 30 minutes, which was in Ramsden Street. Though the distance between the pub and his house was only 10 minutes, because of heavy drinking, he didn't remember what caused him 30 minutes delay. He reached home at 9 p.m. and started to prepare for something big. What was running in his mind? No one knew. He went straight to his room, loaded three guns, and sorted out additional ammunition. He clipped a 10-inch sheath knife onto his belt and put a single bullet into the left pocket of his jeans. At 9.30 p.m., he quietly left the house. He had the Ruger rifle in his left hand, the Mossberg shotgun in his right, and the M14 slung over his shoulder. It was the day when he was ready to enter the fantasy world he created in his mind where he was the predator and everyone around was the prey. In his mind, he developed a game where he was the leading player and the rest of the world were extras. Ramsden Street was empty and he couldn't find anyone walking or passing by in the car. He started walking toward the West Railway Crossing. There was a pedestrian gate to enter, but he quietly slipped through a hole in the wire fence at the side of the intersection and started walking over the railway lines. He kept moving in the dark, and when he came out, he was on the four-lane arterial road called Hoddle Street. There was a wide strip of grass, shrubs, and trees. Knight kept walking and then knelt by the side of a tree. He looked around and surveyed the scene. There was heavy traffic on Hoddle Street with engine noise, headlights, and taillights. Everyone was in a hurry to reach home as it was already midnight. Knight was a coward. He didn't have the guts to act in daylight, so he chose darkness to fulfill his evil mission. He didn't want to feel bad before making any attempt, so he's hiding behind the tree, looking around and finding a close target to begin. Finally, he aimed with his Ruger rifle at a shadow behind the steering wheel of a southbound car and pulled the trigger. He shot several times, but didn't dare to show himself. He hid behind the trees beneath the giant Coca-Cola billboard near the Clifton Hill Railway Station. For him, the fun time began, but it was a night of terror and shock for the others. Once again, he opened fire, and people could only guess the shooter's whereabouts by the flash coming out from the rifle. All his life, his fantasies of seeing action in East Timor, Irian Jaya, Philippines, Thailand, Burma, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Beirut, and especially South Africa and Central America was coming true. Today, he created his own combat zone. The bullets hit several car drivers but received minor wounds. Knight fired on every car passing by. Constable Glenn Nichols and Constable Belinda Borchier learned about the shootings and drove to the scene with lights and sirens as they radioed D-24. Knight was now changing position and he kept reloading and firing. Kevin Skinner, his wife Tracy, and their son Adam were going on their way when Tracy was shot in the face and died instantly. Her son Adam, who was in her lap, also received wounds. The road was filled with dead bodies and blood spattered everywhere. Police approached him with the high beam headlights of their cars. As Delahunty and Lockman took up positions behind their police car and called upon Knight to surrender, Knight squatted down beside a low brick wall and searched his pockets vainly for his suicide bullet. When he realized he had lost it, he leaned out into the headlight beams and dropped the empty M14 on the ground. He then slowly stood up with his hands in his air. When he was fully upright, Constable Delahunty stepped out from behind the rear of the police car and fired a shot at him. Knight ducked back behind the low brick wall. As Delahunty and Lockman again called on him to surrender, he yelled back, Don't shoot! I'm coming out! 
He again rose with his hands in the air before walking onto the street where Delahunty and Lockman arrested him. Knight was driven in an unmarked police car to the St. Kilda Road Police Complex. Julian Knight will never be released according to the law. He will spend all his life behind bars. That's a wrap for today. Don't forget to smash the thumbs up, share, and subscribe to the channel to see our latest content.